What's up again everybody, today we are going to put together a full and complete guide on how to play Icelander. Icelander, the new elemental wizard hero, is surging in popularity as far as Blitz is concerned, and for good reason. She's proving that you can play this disruptive control game with wizard and be consistently successful. So in today's video we're going to break down how that actually happens, what deck lists and archetypes look like. Um, general overall strategies, and how I built my own personal version of Icelander, and uh, how I've gone and tinkered with it over the course of the past few weeks. So first things first, we have to talk about the hero if we want to know what she does and what the deck does. Icelander is a really cool looking elemental wizard hero. She has four intellect, which means she gets four cards at every turn, and uh, 18 health. She has essence of ice, so you can play ice cards in your deck in addition to wizard cards and generic cards. Um, you can even play elemental cards technically, uh, but not many people are doing that. Uh, what she says, though, is very interesting. She says if it's not your turn, you can play non-attack action cards uh, with blue color stripes, so things that pitch for three, non-attack ones, again, that pitch for three, from your arsenal as though they were an instant. And you don't have to pay any extra resources to do so, you just pay for the card. If it's free and it's a blue stripe non-attack, then it can come from arsenal on your opponent's turn at instant speed. Also, if you play an ice card during their turn, and whenever you do so, they will re like receive a Frostbite token. You just give them a Frostbite in addition to any other effects. So it's a very flexible ability depending on what ice cards you play and depending on what blue color stripe cards you play as well. And there's two different archetypes that have come from this Icelander hero ability. There's the archetype that is all sort of wizardy things with disruption mixed in. It's sort of just playing normal wizard things. It looks like a, a Kano deck more or less but with the inclusion of an ice package that allows you to play some disruption and some sort of slowing down effects against your opponent. Um, heck, you could even play a new weapon, which we'll talk about later. But you could also play this very interesting hybrid list that mixes, in a new way that we've never actually seen before, mixes attacks with arcane damage. And both are actually being represented fairly well at tournaments. We had uh, two results actually on fabtcg.com, two deck lists that are playing the more traditional uh, wizard build that, you know, have like forked lightnings, that have stir uh, the aether winds, they have um, the, the new school aether wildfire with snapbacks, uh, and it functions, and they won skirmishes. And then over the past weekend, we saw a top four Icelander list that played the more hybrid build where you had uh, Command and Conquers, Enlightened Strikes, and the very, very spicy Fire Breathing, which is actually just straight up a good card in this deck, going just for, uh, against what, like tons of Viscerize and other um, decks and, and cutting through into the top eight and then again into the top four. So doing well with both different archetypes. So you're actually able with this new hero to play multiple different archetypes and find success if you know how it functions. So I'm gonna break down first the core cards for both archetypes because I extrapolated a bunch of lists. I dug, I compared my list to a bunch of other lists and I extrapolated what are the core cards. There's 20 to 22 core cards depending on how you split one specific card. And we're gonna talk about those cards, why they're core, and what the general game plan is for either of the decks, and then we'll talk about how they differ from that point forward. All right, so here are the core cards for both Icelander archetypes, and I have almost all of these cards in my own deck. There's one that you could kind of pivot, in my opinion, in and out of core, but there's a lot of lists running it, so I may try adding it back into my own personal list. But let's break it down um, card by card, if you will. So first of all, we have four copies of Emeritus Scolding, uh, the red copies and the blue copies. This is going to be a blue heavy deck. Um, there's generally a lot of disruption in uh, the deck, and there's a lot of things that you want to pitch blue for. Namely, you could also pitch blue into uh, 
uh, the weapon, Kraken's Aether Vein, which is now becoming quite popular, and it's pretty cool as well. But there are general lists that are running um, Crucible as well. So Blue Emeritus Scolding, you can play from your arsenal with um, Icelander's Hero ability, and the blue uh, just coming across for four against your opponent on your opponent's turn, just paying two for it, uh, is not bad. Really, the red one is the interesting one. You can play the red off of like um, your boots, so you just use the wizard boots and then you play the red on your opponent's turn for six uh, in combination with a couple of other cards that might allow you to push even more damage. But it's a nice little finisher and it's something that, heck, even if you play Emeritus Scolding on your own personal turn, it's still a two for four arcane, which is not terribly bad. But uh, it's, it's one of those cards that's a go tall overall, like it goes for six and then you can push it even further with like uh, specific cards that you may want to run that aren't in this core package. But Emeritus Scolding, seeing play in literally every list that I've seen for Icelander that has placed highly and in my lists as well, it's a good card in this exact setup. Sigil of Solace also, I looked at a ton of lists and there was one that wasn't running Sigil of Solace, double Sigil of Solace. There was one list that I saw that um, placed really highly that was running a single copy of Sigil. Um, I have personally two copies of Sigil as well. I think it's just pure solid in this, in this, it's it's interesting. In this meta, there's not a lot of people that are running Sigil of Solaces for the life gain. They've kind of cut them because, like Visrai, for example, super explosive, just wants to go for it. Oldham, just very defensive, doesn't really need it. If they're gonna win, they're gonna win on just milling you out of cards by just de defending and defending. They don't need the extra life. So not a lot of Sigil of Sauls being played. I'm not saying it's gone completely, but it's not as uh, prevalent in both of those decks. And both of those, I, I would say, are probably the two best be decks in the format. Um, and so you see lots of Sigils going away. Uh, yeah, but Sigil's really popular in this deck, and it's really great, especially when you start at 18 health, uh, to know that in your back pocket you could have these. Plus, you can still arsenal these and play them, and your opponent is like, oh, they have an arsenal, I should worry about a blue doing something crazy, and so I can maybe hold back. Oh, you just Sigil on the end of your turn, and, uh, they're like, ah, oh, dang. Uh, Red Snapback almost always played, almost always played, I will say that some of the hybrid deck lists, the one that have more attack actions, cuts Snapback, but it's great on a turn where you want to go Red Emeritus Scolding into Snapback. Uh, you pop the boots, pitching a blue, you play Emeritus Scolding, you pitch one more thing and have Snapback available. It's pretty decent, pretty solid. And if you uh, if you have other ways and other finishers lined up as well, you can just play Snapback on your turn. Uh, you can play it on your opponent's turn, uh, depending on how you line things up. Um, the red ones specifically can just come in and deal three extra arcane damage over the top of your opponent. You're still doing wizard things with this deck. Red Voltic Bolt and Blue Voltic Bolt, um, both in uh, a lot of Kano lists are just gone now. They ju you just cut these because they're too expensive, especially in the Go Wide Kano. But in uh, Go Tall Icelander, which is kind of her archetype, kind of her thing, uh, you just run these. You run these out on your turn and you ask your opponent to pitch away cards so that they don't take a bunch of damage. Um, and it's just super solid in this exact setup because, again, we're not playing the kind of combo-oriented, well, not always. We're not, most of the time, not playing the combo-oriented version of Wizard, which is more Kano's thing. We're playing more of a Go-Tall variant, and in doing so, we can play, um, you know, attacks that go big, which, like, for example, Voltic is a five arcane damage, like, no one's stopping all that arcane, usually. Um, Emeritus Scolding on your opponent's turn is a six. It just pushes a bunch of arcane damage in one chunk, right? So this is kind of her strategy with these arcane damage pieces. And these are these are all core, I would say. Um, also core is the ice package. Blizzard, double blizzard, which just allow you to steal cards from your opponent's hand uh, when they don't want to, or they just, their, their turn's basically over. For most, <laughs> most heroes, Blizzard just says, I give you a frostbite by playing it on your turn and your turn is over. Or I give you a frostbite on your turn and you have some trick, but you've been uh, significantly hampered from there. So playing Blizzard is just the nuts. Uh, Winter's Bite's also nuts. In fact, I think Winter's Bite is so good, uh, spe specifically the blue one. The blue one from Arsenal, giving your opponent um, a Frostbite and then also asking them to get rid of a card or pay one resource. Uh, same as Blizzard in a lot of respects. It's asking them to pay two resources, which is basically giving up a card, or their turn's done because they lose go again. This card's so good, I would say, that I'm actively considering ways to cut the deck down so I can add reds or yellows in. Because uh, I think Winter's Bite on my turn, like playing Winter's Bite, 
and forcing my opponent to like remove cards from their hand, so incredibly disruptive to most of the decks in the format. Like you play this against Viscerai and their turns are significantly hampered uh, just by playing one single version of this and that's not even doing things on their turn. Uh, Channel Lake Frigid, a fantastically good card. This is why this deck exists, I think. In my opinion, Channel Lake Frigid being accessible is probably why this deck exists at a high level. It's too good, it's so good uh, to be able to slam this down on your opponent's turn and then on your turn, pitch an ice card to use an effect or play a card, and then channel sticks around because you pitched an ice card on your turn. But remember, you played this on their turn and probably on like the first thing that they do on their turn. And so you're forcing them to pay the tax throughout their turn, and then you're using it on your turn and you're refreshing it, if you will, using the effect to pitch an ice card. And then you are passing it back over to their turn. They have to deal with it again. If you have two ice cards, the game's done. Like, it's ridiculous if you can stick it for two turns of your turns, because it's literally three of their turns. That's insane. Um, I even, for, <laughs> this was crazy, I played a game wherein I stuck a Channel Lake Frigid. Um, I la had it last for a turn. And then on their turn, I stuck another Channel Lake Frigid. The first one died, the second one stuck around. It was like four turns worth of Channel Lake Frigid. It's crazy. Uh, double Energy Potion is also just un unanimously played in every list. You play Double Energy Potion. It is so much better than any other deck. Energy Potion in this deck is so much better because this is a non-attack action card that you can arsenal and play on your opponent's turn. And because it's an instant speed, you can actually play it out from your arsenal and pop it if you wanted to for two resources. Uh, it, it's like a fantastic, perfect fit. So you play exactly these. Um, if you had the capability of playing three energy potions and blitz, you probably would in this deck because it's that good. And then we come to the last card and this one for me is divisive. I actually don't have this rounds on me in the list anymore. I used to because I thought it was fun and spicy, but over time I've stopped liking the fact that it gives both players a card draw um, because if you play this on your turn like you're okay with that but then you're giving them more ways to kind of just deal with whatever disruption you have um, that being said it is played pretty much unanimously it is a block three it's a non-attack that you can play on their turn as well and it kind of nerfs their thing it's it's the good thing about it is it's like a zen state token it blocks one ad nauseum which is great for physical attacks Viscerai is so good right now, though, because he can push arcane damage on you. Um, all of the, like, physical attacks, they're fine. They're good. The other rune blades can do that. But what makes Viscerai better, in my opinion, than those other rune blades right now is that he can go, like, nine tall rune chants on you. And honestly, that's the thing that Icelander and other wizards are uncomfortable into. Like, we're comfortable as wizards just using our hand to block physical attacks, but the pitching to deal with arcane and stopping on hit physical attacks that's where things get awkward for every hero i don't even know what i'm saying wizard it's awkward for every hero so for me this rounds on me is sort of a mixed bag i've kind of pivoted back and forth this is your core for both archetypes though keep in mind there's two ways to play um icelander at this current juncture there's the um wizardy way the pure wizard deal arcane damage way um running like one nourishing emptiness and then there's the hybrid wizard both decks run basically the same suite of 22 cards. There you go. So start with these 22 cards, and then we can talk about how we pivot from there. So first of all, let's talk uh, and take a look at a list that I put together that is more pure wizard stuff, like what you would do with this deck. All right, so I put this list together here in FabDB. This is Gregory Patelis's first place skirmish deck list. It's very similar to a lot of other um, pure wizard Icelander decks. There's a lot of similarities here. I charted this along with a lot of other uh, decks that I've found and watched and played myself, put together myself. And so I wanna break his down uh, because it is a skirmish winning deck list and one that we can talk about since it's posted on Fab uh, TCG. And uh, kudos to him for picking up a skirmish win with this list. So like I said, this is a pure arcane focused Icelander version of uh, you know the archetype itself, and it focuses on some of these big power cards like Aether Wildfire and Forked Lightning. So you can pick it, pick away at your opponent um, with you know normal arcane damage attacks like Scalding Rain, Red, um, Snapback, Voltic Bolt, all of these things that you would normally play down and deal 
damage to your opponent with. Heck, you can even play like Aether Flare. Um, and it's better in this deck than it is in Kano in my opinion, but like Aether Flare into Snapback is, is super solid. I mean, it's solid in both wizards. Uh, but you can play this kind of disruption game, or this kind of damage game, because you have disruption on the back end, um, and you can kind of steal cards from your opponent's hand in that respect. Uh, so you're playing these similar kind of combos out. Again, you see a lot of the cards that we talked about, um, Emeritus Scolding, Sigil of Solaces, all the Voltic Bolts, um, and then you get down here into the disruption package, you see Blizzards, Channel Lake Frigids, Winter's Bites, this round's on me, and then of course um, Energy Potion. Now the, the thing that makes this a pure wizard list is that we are only running one, basically one attack that we're going to attack with, and that's Nourishing Emptiness. Nourishing Emptiness over here on the far side uh, is our big attack, and the only thing that turns off Nourishing Emptiness is these two copies of Icy Encounter. Um, and so for me, if I were looking at this list, I would ask the question, is this Icy Encounter good enough in running, or can we swap it out for um, something like a, oh heck, what's that card? Uh, Polar Blast, Blue Polar Blast, which is oftentimes run in the other version of this list. Could a Blue Polar Blast be a sub in here, or do you want this for attack sometimes? And sometimes you, you could actually maybe see playing this um, on your turn if you draw into it and you just don't have anything else. Uh, but you run this, by the way, because it feeds your Channel Lake Frigid um, even more. You want some number of ice cards, more so than just your couple, like Blizzards and Winter's Bites. You want some number of ice cards to be able to pitch into Channel Lake Frigid to keep it around, and this is one way that people are doing that. The other way is most often Polar Blast, uh, but here he runs Icy Encounter. Now, again, we want to talk about like the overall game plan for this, we want to disrupt on our opponent's turn by arsenaling blue non-attacks and then jamming them out there and uh, making your opponent suffer because you're playing things like uh, Winter's Bite and forcing cards from their hand and giving them Frost Bites. Or you're, um, you know, kind of faking them out and push, pushing like a Sigil of Solace into the arsenal and then playing Sigil of Solace. Um, in this deck, you can like Arsenal Blue Voltic Bolts and Emeritus Scolding, Scalding Rains. You can play those out as well and jam down Arcane Damage. And then eventually you're picking away at your opponent with that, plus this loadout, this weapon loadout. Whoa, what happened? I exploded the weapon loadout button. How crazy was that? Look at that. It's exploded. Maybe I have to zoom out. Nope, it's just dead. The, what, what if I do like that? <laughs> it just shows Storm Striders. <laughs> Hold on, technical difficulties. Okay, we fixed it. Holy moly, for a minute there it was like totally exploded. Um, we, we pitch all these cards away and we play this disruption and we can pitch into Kraken's Aether Vein, which is a weapon that deals one damage and allows us to draw a card. It's an instant, so we can do it on our turn and our opponent's turn. Super powerful um, overall, which is funny because like it deals one damage and it draws you a card, but it's so um, repeatable. You can just do it whenever you need. Uh, you can pitch from hand to uh, activate this effect, and then like they have to make this weird decision where do they want you to draw a card, do they not want you to draw a card, or are you just gonna ping them down slowly so that you can set them up for an Aether Wildfire, popping the boots, of course, doing the Storm Striders thing. Aether Wildfire into Snapback, or Aether Wildfire into, um, you know, like any other blue card from your arsenal is actually pretty decent as well. So like Aether Wildfire, weirdly enough, you can actually go Aether Wildfire into Scour if your opponent is running Auras. Like if you're playing Viscerai, you can pitch Scour and then Aether Wildfire buffs um, the Scour damage that would deal. Uh, but even Aether Wildfire into Scalding Rain, really your big combo in my opinion in this version of the deck is the stir forked combo and if we if we cycle to just showing like the pitch value as we can go here and we just go pitch if we go here um, we have red stir and red forked lined up on this deck this is in my opinion the the big finisher combo you go stir forked uh, with the boots so that you can finish your opponent off in that respect uh, but you just pick at them with arcane damage until they're low enough that you uh, put them in uh, stir forked range. And then heck, you can even metacarpus nodes them, which are down here at the bottom. Stir forked metacarpus nodes um, is a six cost uh, thing. Um, if you have a, an e pot out, it technically costs seven because uh, if you want to do the metacarpus nodes and the storm striders, so you you storm striders metacarpus nodes on top of your uh, stir forked, and it costs seven. If you're playing the um, Crucible in this respect, then you can pop that as well uh, with the extra point of energy potion damage. All this to say, 
you're doing normal wizard stuff. So it's not that different from Kano. It's just now that we have um, the opportunity to disrupt with some of these cards. A couple other cards I didn't talk about, like Scour. I think you should probably consider running two Scours. I bounce between one and two um, because of the meta. If you're seeing a lot of Viscerai in your area, this card is nuts in Icelander because it's a blue pitch. You can play at instant speed and uh, you can pitch into it as much as you want and destroy all their rune chants at instant speed. It's really good. Pry as well is just a meme card in the best of ways because it looks like me. Look, if I go like this, it kind of looks like me. Uh, but also Pry is interesting in that you can play it very simply without paying any resources from your arsenal and uh, force your opponent to cycle a card from their hand, basically. their best. You take their best card, you put it at the bottom, and then they draw a card to replace it. So that is um, another form of disruption. I actually don't run Pry. Even though it does look like me, I don't run that card. But it's worth a try uh, as well. And in this version, this is what the equipment loadout looks like. Uh, a lot of people are running uh, skull cap, tunic, um, boots, and node. Uh, you sub the gauntlets in for Benji. Uh, you play deep blue sometimes if you feel like the game isn't going to go very long so that you don't get the tunic resource and you just go deep blue instead. Gambler's gloves so that you don't die against KO or against um, like Reinar. Uh, Heart of Ice is so nuts. It's so nuts against uh, Kano in this matchup because like you just this is like such a good matchup uh, against Kano. Kano's like really bad into this. Um, Null Rune, you, you bring that in against Kano as well. Kraken's Aether Vein, you can play this almost all the time if you want to or you can play Crucible instead for setting up like big stir forked combos and things like that. So this is the um, more wizardy side. Let's go to the hybrid side because I'm really hyped about that. All right, so this is my own personal hybrid list. This is the list that I play and the list that I put together and there's some tweaks that I'm making to it as I play it. Um, but I really like the way that it plays overall. I think it's a lot of fun to be able to play some of these attack action cards with a wizard shell. And again, you're going to look and you're going to see most of the same cards that I've mentioned. I have this separated by pitch, but I'll just group it by type um, as well. I, I, I could just leave it ungrouped, actually, which makes it a little easier to see. So, still running the Emeritus Scolding, still running the Sigils. Um, I'm running Sinks uh, in this version of it. We have... Um, the red snapbacks, the multiple voltic bolts, blizzards, channel lakes, uh, energy potions. Uh, we have the scours, in my opinion, are just nuts, and then winter's bite. But let me break this down based on type. So the difference here in play style is that the hybrid list allows you to play disruptively in a different manner because now you're presenting physical threats that your opponent could be prepared for if they bring physical equipment, but oftentimes against wizards, they'll side that equipment out in favor of Null Rune. And they should, they should respect the arcane damage that you can do. Even with this list, they should respect the arcane damage that you can do. We're not running Stir Forked. Um, I think it's, it's one thing that I'm actually considering pivoting into, like maybe swapping out a few things, but I like my blues being where they're at. So I'm not quite sure about that yet, but nevertheless, this is where I've settled on it. And there's a lot of cool things about this. First of all, we get to run E-Strikes. Enlightened Strike's a fantastic little card. If we play stuff on our opponent's turn and just kind of chuck some stuff out there, then we can um, basically E-Strike for seven on our turn and just tuck away any card. This costs nothing. It costs us a card, but because it costs us a card, it could cost us a red card if we had a, a all of a sudden like a, a red heavy hand. So in that instance, Enlightened Strike is a seven cost that, uh, or a seven attack, I should say, that can be paid for by, you know, anything, like a red. It's like a one for seven in that respect. Um, it's fantastic. You can also choose go again on this. You can go five, tuck a card, go again, and then play um, like an Emeritus Scolding or a Voltic Bolt if you have the resources for it after tucking, um, which is really cool. Uh, you can play some like really nasty stuff too. Like you can play some weird tricky things like Enlightened Strike, um, choose like draw a card and then sigil on the end of that, uh, which is pretty fun. There's a, like a lot of cool little Enlightened Strike things that you can do with this deck, but playing it for seven feels really good when your opponent's like more committed to blocking arcane damage with their equipment because this just requires cards or it gets them lower in life. Uh, the kind of nuts card, which I talked about earlier, is Fire Breathing. This card is sort of, in this version of the deck, in the hybrid version, this card is your linchpin card, which is a weird thing to say. This is like the stir-forked of this variant 
of the deck. Because Fire Breathing, while a lot of people say it's pretty bad, is incredibly scalable. Fire Breathing costs you two and it attacks for three, but it has an instant pay one resource, gain one attack, and then you can activate this as many times as you want. So, you can arsenal of Fire Breathing, take a bunch of damage from your opponent, hold a hand of four blues, play Fire Breathing, and then threaten to buff it by seven. You can also do the same thing with E-Pots on the board, and the E-Pots can add into the uh, Fire Breathing, because you can destroy them, gain more resources, pitch it into Fire Breathing. So Fire Breathing can, at any given moment, present like 12 damage to your opponent, depending on what your hand composition is. And of course, your opponent doesn't know your hand composition, so you can bluff, double bluff, like threaten a bunch of damage in really fun ways. And your opponent has to go, okay, so if I, if I don't block this, can they just blow me out? And if I do block this, should I block it first of all? And if I do block it, uh, are they just gonna like, you know, whatever and hold all that stuff till later? Maybe so, because now I've overcommitted and then I can do more stuff on their turn. So it's a fun little uh, tech piece. It's it, Honestly, it's not even a tech piece. I don't know why I called it that. It's like a linchpin of this deck. I do include my own icy encounters, but I personally run more ice cards than um, some lists that I've seen uh, because I wanna keep channel lakes around. Not too many more. Some people run this amount of ice cards as well, but I think I run, what, 10? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and I'm toying with maybe running some more, which is weird, because again, I said I wanted to maybe experiment with putting Winter's Bites, more Winter's Bites in there, but uh, as far as defense reactions, I run Absorb and Aether. I'm considering pivoting this out, but I do run Absorb and Aether because you can actually defend with Absorb and Aether, and then from your arsenal play, like, uh, Rousing Aether, all for a blue, and uh, this will actually buff Rousing Aether, which is kind of nice, it pushes four damage. You can actually do the same thing with Emeritus Scolding. Pitch a blue, play Absorb an Aether, block four, and then Emeritus Scolding for six. As a nice little return, that's pretty solid. Do the same thing with Voltic Bolt. You pitch a blue, you play Absorb an Aether to block four, and then Voltic Bolt pushes five. It's, it's a solid little combo, and it's one that uh, is perhaps underrated because we are able to just pay whatever the cost is from Arsenal, thanks to Icelander's ability. So very powerful little combo, and one that I kind of like. I am considering taking this out so that I can fit some other stuff in, but right now I like it. Sinks are in there because Sink Below. Channel Lake Frigids are in there because Channel Lake Frigids. I include Polar Blast because I can Arsenal this play it, give my opponent a, um, a Frostbite, and then uh, draw a card to replace it. It's, it's kind of just straightforward, and it allows you to float two resources just in case you want to do something else with them, because sometimes you do uh, overall. So I run red snapbacks and blue snapbacks. Some lists, some hybrid lists, cut the red snapbacks and just run the blues for the pitch. Uh, because you're not playing as many uh, overall arcane attacks. I may consider doing that as well and uh, squeezing in like Command and Conquerors to push more attacks just because I think that'd be fun. Uh, but I run Blue Stirs. I think in this version of the deck, Blue Stir is actually underratedly good because Blue Stir allows you to play a little bit of more of the arcane stuff, like go Blue Stir into Emeritus Scolding like the red version of Emeritus Scolding, just to play it at instant speed, pushes seven damage, um, and that's pretty decent when it's arcane and your opponent can't respond. Um, the rest of this looks pretty similar. I do wanna say there's a lot of people running Heart of Fiendal, and I do have Heart of Fiendal in here just cause I have it, but honestly, you can pivot this card out for any other blue uh, overall. And I do wanna say that my blue count is I think 24, yep, I have 24 blue pitch cards. There are certain certain people that play, you know, a few more. I saw one list that had like 27 blue cards and I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of blue. Um, and then there's uh, certain lists that kind of go threadbare on it and run a little bit more reds. Um, so it's like a kind of an even split, which is a little strange as well, in my opinion. But I do run the, right now I'm running the two blue scours because Viscera is just everywhere. And blue scour in this deck is nuts. So you should definitely play two if you have a lot of Viscera in your area. But this is more the style that you would play or the deck construction that you would play if you want the hybrid version of Icelander. You wanna basically just play out um, you know, these 
attacks like Enlightened Strike and Fire Breathing when you have large uh, blue composition hands, or just to push card advantage on your turn. Um, you threaten them and you disrupt them on their turn with Channel Lake Frigid, with Blizzard, um, with little pings, like uh, you could play like Blue Snapback for one, just little things like that. And then you gain the incremental value by hitting them with uh, Kraken's Aether Vein, a fantastic little blue pitch weapon. Um, this deck, I do run the Kraken's Aether Vein. I don't run the other one. Just straight up, I run Kraken's Aether Vein because uh, it turns any of your blues into draw a card. One attack, draw a card. Your opponent do it on your turn. Your opponent doesn't want to pitch into it because they're losing, um, you know, resources. Same thing as Winter's Bite. You play this on uh, on your turn. They're losing resources on their own turn. You play this on your turn. They're losing resources on your on their turn. Um, same exact thing, and it just pushes incremental value over time. You chip away, and then you pop them with, like, uh, Fire Breathing for 12 or something, and you finish them off on their turn with Pop in the Boots, Go Voltic Bolt, something like that. Uh, the decks, honestly, it's weird. It's funny. The decks do play fairly similarly overall, but one version allows you to play Fire Breathing. So come on! No. <laughs> They're, they both have a similar game plan into most matchups. Um, you, you do very hard pivot in... Um, in uh, Wizard versus Wizard into Heart of Ice because it's just super good. Um, Metacarpus nodes, you run Storm Striders. Uh, I always run Skullcap. I do run Tunic over most things. In this deck, you do tend to go longer because you have Disruption. People do include Deep Blue. Um, I have seen certain lists that run like Command and Conquer uh, run Goliath Gauntlet, which I think is hilarious. You put Goliath Gauntlet in so that you can Goliath Gauntlet, your Command and Conquer, and your Fire Breathing, because it costs two. Um, I Here's the, the spiciest thing that I, I was thinking about. Because you can run Fire Breathing, which costs two, and maybe Command and Conquer, which costs two, Wizard Pummel. You just play Pummel. That seems too out there, so I'm not doing it, but that just seems too funny. And it is disruption in some way, shape, or form. So this is Icelander. This is how I've built my personal Icelander deck. I run the hybrid version. Um, I think it's just a really fun way to play her, and it's one that I've had a decent bit of success with, and there's a lot of people who have had really good success at skirmishes and at, um, you know, calling Krakow, for example, this past weekend, top four. So, I highly encourage you to pick Icelander up, give her a shot. If you're dipping your toes into the wizard sphere of things, she's literal, literal perfection for picking up wizard and just getting a feel for how wizard works. It definitely takes a little bit of playing, both in wizards in general and Icelander, kind of feeling out what she wants to do. But if you're, especially if you're playing this version of the deck, but if you're playing like the pure wizard and you've already played wizard before, it feels great. It feels uh, fantastic not to pitch off the top. And if you're playing this version, it feels really nice to play E strikes in your <laughs> in your uh, wizard stuff. So hey, if you enjoyed this video, if you got something out of it, uh, feel free to make a number, go to a number. And if you want to tell me what video or what hero I should do next um, in a guide to how to play that hero, let me know that in a comment below. As always, everybody, thanks for watching.